Good morning, Santa Clarita. Welcome in. You are listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. This is SCVI and I lead school's Eye on the Valley. I am your host, Matt Watson. You know, just listening to that MEND cryotherapy commercial, you know, MEND quickly became one of our favorite sponsors back uh, when the pandemic first hit. I think it was probably back in April or May when they started advertising that because they had to close due to the pandemic, they were freezing everyone's membership. And I thought that was great. MEND cryotherapy, freezing everybody's membership. That was genius. Anyways... Our show, Eye on the Valley, is brought to you by SCBI and iLead Schools. We are a network of charter schools with campuses in Castaic, Agua Dulce, Lancaster. We've also got virtual campuses. And no, not temporary virtual campuses. We've got a fully accredited online school, as well as a, and that online school is, is kindergarten through 12th grade, by the way. Um, and, you know, my, my first question when we opened up kindergarten online is how do you, how do, you do that with kindergartners? Well, with uh, innovative curriculum like the Create Crate and the amazing things that they do to connect with kids every day, uh, it, it is just an incredible program. You need to check it out at iLeadOnline.org. We've also got a burgeoning homeschool program, iLead Exploration. You can visit all of our schools at iLeadSchools.org, and from there you can kind of peruse whatever works best for you and, and your learner. And uh, so, yeah, that's our show. We've got our eye on education in Santa Clarita as, as well as across the nation. But like our show says, we also keep our eye on the valley as well, bringing you everything that you need to know about what's what here in the valley. And, uh, well, we, we try to do it all while having a little bit of fun. If, uh, if you know me, I, I, I will refuse to do just about anything and, unless I can laugh while I'm doing it. Uh, yeah, even at work. It gets me in trouble at board meetings sometimes, but... Uh, but I enjoy laughing and, and, and playing around and, and having a good time. And that's what we try to do here on the air. We have a good time with everything we do. A little bit later on today, you're going to be hearing about some of the great things that are happening at our schools, even during the pandemic shutdown. There's a, there's a lot of great things about our schools. The exciting and innovative curriculum. We use a project-based curriculum, which really gets kids uh, involved in their own learning. Um, our passionate teachers. But I think my favorite... Uh, thing uh, about our, our schools is the lack of district boundaries, right? You, you don't have to attend that local neighborhood school. As long as you live in LA County or an adjoining county, you can attend one of our iLead schools here in California. So our families do, they, they really do come from all around LA, Ventura, Kern Counties, uh, Kern County, San Bernardino County, Orange County, and, uh, and all for free. So yeah, that's right. We are a tuition-free public school system. Uh, so again, feel free to check us out at iLeadSchools.org and, uh, and peruse the exciting things that we've got going on. Speaking of which, it is, gosh, it's another beautiful day in the valley. We're working our way toward the high 70s today. As we move into the weekend, we're getting a temporary reprieve from the wind. It is nice out there. It's gorgeous here in downtown Newhall. And it's Friday, so we're excited about that. We've got another great show for you coming today. I'm really excited about that as well. We've got our, our city librarian coming in a little bit later on. Did, did you know we had a, a city librarian? Well, it's true. She and her team are absolutely amazing. Shannon Vonnegut will join us next break. We'll catch up with her and, and see what's new at our local libraries as our kids are starting to head back on campus. And, uh, and then after that, we've got an early edition today of Big T's Five Minutes of Fame. Big T will be here with some fun and games for us today. He always, he always brings a, a, a smile to everybody's face. So you know what? You know what might be fun? Let's ask Librarian Shannon if she'll stick around and, and, and maybe play trivia or listen to the fun facts that, that Big T brings with us. And then in hour number two, we're going to be talking space exploration. You know, tis the season. Last week, NASA's Perseverance rover landed on Mars as exploration began there. And today we're going to be talking with Kathleen Fredette and Shauna Brown. They're captaining a project at SCVI and several other iLead schools where kids are taking part in space exploration. And no, they're, they're not just charting the phases of the moon and, and looking toward the sky. This isn't just a fun space-themed school project to get kids excited about what's going on at NASA. Our kids are actually proposing, designing, conducting, and yes, launching experiments on SpaceX that are being conducted in space by NASA scientists as we look toward their future of the colonization of 
the Mars and the Moon. So that's in our in the nine o'clock hour, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit later on. But I wanted to start with this. You know, I was having some fun earlier in the week, bumping around on social media the other day. You know, avoiding work, and uh, and I came across a post that really kind of piqued my interest. Um, if you've tuned into city council meetings or been on local Santa Clarita Facebook groups lately, you're, you're familiar with everybody's favorite next door neighbor, Steve Petzold. Well, Steve found a gem of an article from the LA Times from way back in the summer of 1992. The article chronicles our city council toying with the idea of a city motto. Well, here, the, the article is, is not long, so let me just read it to you real quick. The article is titled, Motto Fever, and, and remember, this is 1992. Santa Clarita does not have an official motto, but uh, perhaps it should be the city that can't make up its mind. The four-year-old city held a contest last month to select a motto and received 212 entries, ranging from the unintentionally amusing to the serious to the snide. The city council was to choose Tuesday night from a, a group of slogans such as the better life city, the city that future generations will love, democracy's playground, and the land of the golden dweeb. The motto would have been used on signs and on the municipal letterhead, but the council voted four to one in favor of one of five options presented by the staff, which was forget the whole thing. The entries just weren't quirky enough, Councilwoman Jan Height said sarcastically after rejecting all of them. The only one I really like is Santa Clarita Delivers. And get this, that's the motto that Councilwoman Height submitted herself. Now, Councilman Carl Boyer quipped, uh, uh, Santa Clarita Delivers sounds like a pizza joint. Who cast, uh, he was the, the one that cast the lone vote in favor of selecting a motto from the list. And, and the rest of them, like the article said, uh, uh, voted to just forget the whole thing. The article goes on to say, the competition held to encourage public participation and boost civic pride, attracted national attention and bolstered Santa Clarita's reputation for innovative approaches to government. The city of about 114,000 residents had earned a reputation for quirkiness, partly by painting its buses pink and candy apple red, and by recruiting hairdressers to advise the council. But some council members used well-worn bureaucratic phrases Tuesday to explain their reluctance to choose a motto from the list or print the entries in the local newspaper so residents could do so. The article was written by Times staff writer Tracy Kaplan, and she went on to post some of her favorite entries, which, uh, you know, some of them I, I kind of enjoyed. Uh, the ones that she listed, again, back in 1992, was as solid as an oak. City of Golden Dreams and Western Themes, City of Quiet Adventure, Gateway to the Motherload, This Town Is You, The Crown of North County, Good People, Clean Air. Remember, we had just come out of the 80s where that was a, a very serious issue in Southern California. What's, get this one, what's good for New Hall Land is good for Santa Clarita. Seeing is Believing, A Humanistic Approach to Local Government, and the trail ends in Santa Clarita. Well, again, that was 1992, uh, over a quarter of a century ago. We've added another 100,000 residents since then, but we still don't have a motto. But in true awesome town form, Steve Petzold posted this article and stoked his neighbors for further suggestions. And to date, here are some of the better suggestions that I thought you might enjoy. These are what, uh, what folks are, are suggesting on, on that social media post. How about this one? If you're seeking a pleasant community, look around you. City of Trails or Hiker's Paradise. I like this one. Santa Clarita, a city without portos. Gem of the foothills. There was one valley, one vision. Or a similar one. One valley, one vision, one hospital, one DMV office. Santa Clarita, we call it home. Welcome to the bubble. Santa Clarita is where you want to be. That's an interesting motto. Santa Clarita, where families come first. Santa Clarita, different than Santa Clara. The traditional oak of the golden dream. Tree City, USA. <laughs> Built as planned. Or there's where the good life takes you. I, I, I kind of like that one. That would look good on letterhead. 
There's Santa Clarita, where progress, preservation, and prosperity harmonize. That's kind of poetic. Santa Clarita, where time stands still, but enough about the traffic lights. And then there were two that were similar. Tucked away, or tummy tucked away. <laughs> Land of entitlement. Uh, breeze blows, power goes. I couldn't tell if this one was serious or tongue-in-cheek. Santa Clarita, nice enough. <laughs> Gateway to the Antelope Valley. The Valley Beyond the Valley. This one's kind of a San Francisco Bay Area theme. The City by the Amusement Park. Or come check out our Chiquita Canyons. Now, if you listen to the show much, you know that I love to use the moniker Awesome Town tongue-in-cheek and... The comments on the post did bring frequent mention to Awesome Town, but others were quick and, and frequent to point out that the nickname Awesome Town was actually a marketing campaign by Newhall Land, similar to the more modest Come Home to Valencia campaign. But what about you? If we adopted a city motto, what do you think it should be? Let me know on Facebook. Just uh, You can head on over to the KHTS Radio Facebook feed, Click on the Salmon banner, the live feed for our show, and, and drop me a line there in the comments. Or you can text me, 661-434-1045. That's 661-434-1045. What do you think our city mo motto should be, you know, if we were to adopt one? Let's not forget that this is over 25 years old, but uh, who knows, pets? Maybe we can get the city council to take this back up. So, again, if you've got a, a suggestion, serious or otherwise, for an official motto for the city of Santa Clarita, go ahead and hit us up at the KHTS Radio Facebook feed or text me at 661-434-1045. Let's see what else is going on today. Um, well, you know, I like the, the minor holidays. Today is National Pistachio Day. And I will wish uh, Big T a National Pistachio Day when he calls in. In a couple of breaks, he enjoys his pistachios. It's also National Skip the Straw Day, calling attention to the dangers that plastic straws present to the environment. So uh, if you're sipping a, a cold beverage today, try going with stainless steel or bamboo. My, my son likes the bamboo straws or, or glass. But, you know, don't give me those paper straws because unless you're chugging your drink and getting a brain freeze, that, that paper straw is just going to disintegrate before you even get halfway done with your Slurpee. It is also National Tell a Fairy Tale Day. Not Tell a Lie Day, but Tell a Fairy Tale Day, okay? I used to love uh, reading stories to my kids when they were little and, and when they weren't so little. Now, they're both grown and gone now, so uh, I'm just reading stories on my own. But, uh, but I think this should be more than just one day. I think it should be at least a week or, or a month dedicated to reminding folks to to read fairy tales and, and other stories to each other. In fact, I think reading to our kids should be a lifestyle. Read to your kids, even if they're older. And, uh, you know, if they read well enough to read fairy tales on their own, have them read to you. And if, if you're just getting started, here's a couple of quick tips. Kids like to participate, so, you know, maybe have them quack every time you mention the ugly duckling or, you know, make the motions of Jack climbing the beanstalk. Try using repetition. Uh, oftentimes, uh, fairy tales include repetition, repeated stanzas, syllables. Uh, repeat your movements as, as you go so that the kids get engaged. It helps them to remember the story and then sets them up for the next round of, of repetition. Give your characters a voice. You know, nobody likes a monotone storyteller. So vary your voice for each character and, and inflecting excitement, sadness, and disappointment will, will create drama and and it'll stimulate the, the imaginations of those listening to you. And, and then make sure you ask questions as you go. It's an excellent way to keep your story flowing as well as to gauge the children's listening skills and build comprehension. And, and, and that's a, an important part of, of reading. So go ahead and pick your favorite fairy tale and, and read to someone today. Coming up, speaking of reading, we've got city librarian Shannon Vonnegut calling in. We'll see what her team's got going on at the libraries, and uh, we'll ask her what her favorite fairy tale is. And, hey, maybe we'll see if she's got any ideas for a city motto. And remember, if you've got one, go ahead and drop us a line at the KHTS Radio Facebook feed or text me, 661-434-1045. This is SCVI and I Lead School's Eye on the Valley. You're listening to your hometown station, KHTS. Bring your life. 
we'll help you make the most of it. Introducing Five Point Valencia, a familiar place, and yet wonderfully different, with a fresh mix of homes, schools, parks, trails, and open space. All tuned to the way people want to live today. Learn more at Valencia.com. Traffic brought to you by the law firm of Owen Patterson Owen, helping Santa Clarita drivers recover from life-changing accidents for over three decades. Owen Patterson Owen, encouraging you to drive safely. Visit opolaw.com. Accidents happen, but rest assured Patterson's Collision Center is here to help. Patterson's is a family-owned and operated collision repair facility providing the Santa Clarita Valley with premium collision repairs. Patterson's prides itself on being the only California-certified green repair shop in all of Santa Clarita. They are insurance claim specialists and even offer payment plans for your deductible. For personalized, friendly service, visit PattersonsCollisionCenter.com or call 294-1011 and let Patterson's Collision Center help ease your worries today. Coyote Creek location, there's lots to offer. Three acres of manicured landscape, actually in the heart of Agua Dulce in the Santa Clarita Valley. Crepe in the outdoors? I know I am. What about a baby shower, wedding ceremony, reception, picnic, holiday parties? Everything's been moved outside. We need to support healthy space and distancing, I know. But it's not how far apart we are. It's definitely about the treasured memories we create. Making moments with loved ones, friends, family. How do you beat that? Go to CoyoteCreekLocations.com. You've got to book your next perfect event. CoyoteCreekLocations.com. Your hometown station. KHTS is the only station I listen to. 98.1 FM and AM 1220. Welcome back. You're listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. This is Matt Watson, and you're listening to SCVI and I Lead Schools Eye on the Valley. We're taking your suggestions for city mottos. Yeah, I know it's a story that's about 27 years old, but, uh, but it piqued my interest uh, earlier in the week, and, and, and I'm kind of enjoying it. Producer Sarah is saying that, that she enjoyed the motto, Santa Clarita, it's not as far away as you think. And then there, there are these that we, we received. Santa Clarita, the suburbs suburb. And Santa Clarita, electing Smites since 1988. So I love that one. So if you've got a suggestion for possible city mottos, go ahead and text me at 661-434-1045 or hop on Facebook and go to the KHTS Radio Facebook feed, and uh, this just in, our banner's no, no, no longer salmon. It's green-colored. Go ahead and click on that, drop a, a suggestion for a, a, a city motto there in the chat, and, and who knows, maybe we'll get the city to pick it up. Let's see what our next guest thinks. Shannon Vonnegut has over 30, or, I'm sorry, over 20 years experience uh, in public libraries. She's a graduate of Little Rock High School. She received her AA from Antelope Valley College and a BA from, in history from Cal State San Bernardino and later her Master's of Library and Information Science from San Jose State University. She began her career with the County of Los Angeles Public Library in 1996, becoming Teen Digital Services Librarian in 2011 and Digital Services Manager in 2015. But now, as our city librarian, Shannon is responsible for overseeing staff, programming, operations, and services for all of the Santa Clarita Public Library locations. This role also involves being a visionary and inspirational leader and establishing and instilling a positive organizational culture at the libraries to provide the best public library services for the Santa Clarita community. Good morning, Shannon. Welcome back to Eye on the Valley. Good morning. Thank you for having me back. Of course. It's good to have you. Now, first off, um, as we were talking before, uh, we're, we're talking about a campaign that's over a quarter of a century old looking for a city motto. Do you have any, <laughs> any ideas, any suggestions, anything you'd like to hear for the city of Santa Clarita? Oh, that's a hard one. It's hard to wrap up 
everything in such a short little statement. Um, <laughs> I know here at the library we were discussing this actually yesterday because it's been on Facebook so much. And right. he said, anything that's not two words, comma, two words, we'll take. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Two words, comma, two words is off the table. All right. That's, that's a, <laughs> I love the criteria. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. So, um, you know, with, with everything going on the last, uh, well, gosh, the last year or so, um, things have always been up in the air. Uh, what can you tell us about the, the status of our city libraries? Uh, your locations closed back in March, I know, when, when we all closed. But, uh, but you guys found some really innovative ways to keep providing services throughout the summer and then well into the school year. Uh, any word on when your locations might be reopening? Um, well, yes, yeah, so and it's been almost a year, which is just shocking when you sit and think about it. Well, they told us um, two weeks. That, that was kind of <laughs> how we started. Right? We, we've quickly been adapting. Um, our physical buildings are still closed, but I really like to say the library isn't closed. We're just offering a different service model right now. Right. Um, we have really been working on expanding what we are offering. Um, we have a computer lab at Valencia, so if you just needed to use a computer for an hour for something, that's available. So we have limited letting people in the buildings, but still not available to come in and browse. Um, we do Wi-Fi printing. We do passports, curbside pickup. We have our lockers, which make things available 24-7. All of our programming is happening online starting in February. We started our spring session of story time and programming, and that's been really popular as usual. So that's been, that's been exciting. Um, we are starting a new program in March that we're just going to try out, and we're calling it Sidewalk Story Times. So it will be our first starting to get back to some in-person programming. Very limited. Um, amount of people that can come to it, but it will be at New Hall Library. So each Friday in March, we'll be having story times outside where you can actually see people and interact a little bit, mm -hmm. but keeping it socially distanced and, of course, wearing masks. So we're going to try that out in March and kind of see how that goes. But starting to dip our toes back into the in-person aspect of our library services. So that's kind of exciting. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I know you guys have provided tons of services, even with uh, with the doors still closed. It's good to hear that uh, that we're dipping our toes back into uh, to getting back together uh, a little bit. So I know it's limited, and I, I certainly understand why it has to be. You mentioned a computer lab at Valencia, mm -hmm. um, the sidewalk story time at Newhall. Um, being that this has to be limited, do people need to sign up? And, and if so, you know, where do I go to make a reservation to use the computer lab? Or uh, how do I sign up for the sidewalk story time? Things like that. So for the computer lab, just call the library. We can make you an appointment. It's very similar to our old system where you make an appointment for an hour a day to access our computers. Um, you make your appointment with staff, and then when you come to the building, we will open the doors and let you into our community room where we've set up computers and a printer. Um, for the programs, all of our programs now, we're kind of doing registration just to kind of get into that, that habit because that is kind of how we see the rest of the year going, even when we do in person, just to control how many people are there. So our days of story times with like 60 to 80 probably won't be for a little while longer. <laughs> but... Um, the Sidewalk Storytime registration is on our website. We have an events link, which takes you to our calendar, which shows all of the programs and things that are happening. And when you click on that program for Sidewalk Storytimes, you can register there. Okay, cool. And I, I know when most people think of libraries, you know, they think of, uh, uh, of reading, you know, uh, checking out books or, or other, you know, periodicals, things like that. Um, you mentioned that you have the lockers. You guys are still... Um, uh, you still have the program where we can log on to the library website and request books, and then you're putting them in lockers, or is, or you still have the sidewalk pickup? Um, we have both. So you can still, when you go to request an item from our catalog, you can choose whether you want to pick them up at the lockers. The lockers are available at Valencia Library and Canyon Country Library. Um, the, the key thing to that and my favorite thing is it's 24-7. So whether it's on your way to work at like 5 in the morning or after work, you can come by and pick up your items. You don't have to talk to anybody. You can just go over and <laughs> scan your card, get your books, and go. Um, the sidewalk 
hours for our, our curbside service is available Monday through Saturday, and that is from 10 to 5 Monday through Friday and then 1 to 4.30 on Saturday. And that service, you just pull up, call us, we bring your stuff out to you. And that's also for our curbside printing, which you can send your printing jobs to the library. We'll print them out and bring them out to you that way as well. You're kidding. I didn't realize that you guys did that. So instead of having to go to Kinko's and pay whatever it is that they're charging, we can just send things over to you and you guys will print it up for us? We, we do offer that, yes. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> And are you still offering uh, the online or digital library where people can download magazines and movies and things like that? Oh, yeah. That's, that's one of our, our normal things. Um, mm -hmm. We've barely been pushing it over the last year. We've really increased what we're offering in our digital collection that's available for the public. Um, always has been available, will be available, we'll keep growing it, and um, it's a great way to get those resources if you don't want to actually deal with trying to come to the building or do curbside or any of those things. Um, everything is still available online. Okay, and, and speaking of your website, it's santaclaritalibrary.com, santaclaritalibrary.com, pretty simple. I'm, I'm looking at the website now. You guys have tons of resources here. Um, maybe you can uh, uh, just help elaborate a little bit because I'm looking at you guys have got about 12 different tabs that really jump out at you here <laughs> on the on the website here. You, you've got things for for kids and, and parents of kids of all ages. You've, you've got a tab for babies and toddlers, preschoolers, early elementary, upper elementary school, homeschoolers. Uh, so what kind of things would families expect to to find here? Well, this has really shifted over the last year. Um, with so many kids going distance, we really recognized that a lot of parents needed support. It is not easy to try and teach your kid at home. Um, I personally have struggled with trying to teach my daughter some of these math things that I don't understand <laughs> or don't remember how to do because it's been a while. Um, so we made the change on our website to really highlight a lot of our resources and break it down to make it really easy for parents or caregivers to look identify which age group they were working with and get to those resources. Um, we have a lot of databases available which you can use for kids to do research for those projects or reports they need to do. A lot of the reference books now are digital, so it's the actual book that you can like click through the pages. Oh, cool. they, we really don't have reference books in the libraries anymore, it's digital, so all of that is available. Um, we have a live homework help website, which you use your library card, sign in, and then there's live tutoring. So if you are struggling with those things like math or English or whichever subject your child's doing, they can log in and get free sessions with a live tutor and get that homework help. So with that live tutor, um, is that something, again, do I need to make a reservation or, or can I log on and you guys have just got a whole panel of experts sitting there waiting for me to log on that, that are experts in all different kinds of subjects and, and things like that? Yeah, so Brain, it's through a service called BrainFuse, so it's, okay. it's a service we pay for um, and they have subject experts, usually college kids um, or teachers who have been certified in tutoring and have gone through background checks and all of that so that they can be available when you go and log in. There's, I've never seen there be a wait. It's, they seem to, seem to have enough um, people there to help. Um, so you just log in when you need that help, and they are available to provide. And they also have, they can record the session so that oh. you, if you need to go back and review what you went over, you have access to that as well. And, and I love that they're background checked and things like that. So if uh, a child's having trouble with homework or, or, or schoolwork and mom and dad aren't home, they can say, just jump on the library website, log in, and, uh, and, and get some help there. Do they have, are there age limits? Um, is it, do they pretty much cover all subjects? Yeah, it goes through, they even do a little bit of almost into college, but they wow. do have, uh, it's math, science, reading, social studies, they do SAT help, they do oh, AP wow. classes, state tests, they can help with all of those subjects. Wow, you've got help with, with everything here. And I'm just looking, I, I clicked through the upper elementary tab, and it's not just a, a couple of things and, and a book or two. You've got all different kinds of resources for 
for parents, tips for raising a reader, fun sites and games, events going on. And then it looks like you've got your staff that's posting videos and, and, and things like that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You guys are really keeping busy. This is great. We, we, we have definitely been busy. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. So you bring up a good point. There are several of these services that, that we do need to make sure that we log in with our library card. But uh, what if you're, you're like me and, and can't find your library card, don't remember what your number is? Are you still able to, uh, to request a card virtually? Definitely. So you can call us. You can email us. We have people message us on social media. We can find your pin for you. We can renew your library card. We can get you a new card if you've never had one or if you've lost one. Um, all of those services are available. You just reach out to us and we can set you up. Fantastic. Is, is there anything that we're missing? Anything new or events coming up or anything else that we should be talking about? One big event, um, it's almost March. Every March we do our One Story, One City program, which is mostly adult-focused. It's the one thing we do that is just for our primarily adult audience. Um, our book this year is called Eat Joy, Stories of Comfort in Food from 31 Celebrated Writers. All right. So we really looked for a book this year that would make people kind of feel better, um, it's been a rough year, so we wanted something that people could find comfort in. And, of course, food is, yeah. is always a comforting thing. Um, so this book is several short stories. Each short story has a recipe at the end associated with the story. So the writers are writing about how some, something that happened in their life and how food helped them with it or how food relates to it. Um, so we have a month of programming surrounding the book. Um, we're taking recipes, so if anyone wants to contribute to our community cookbook, we're taking recipes through our email account right now. Um, we have the author event coming up where we're doing an author Zoom on, um, on March 27th. And we just have a ton of really good programming for people who are interested in joining in the community read and having that the one book that we have a lot of people in the community reading right now and having discussions and programming around one idea. That sounds like a lot of fun and a great way to, to bring our, our city together. I, I do have to point out that that's one story, one city. That's two words, comma, two words. Are we okay with that? I don't that? think we have a comma in it. Oh, but... there's no comma. Okay, okay, so we're good. <laughs> All righty. Now, Shannon, I mentioned in, in our show's intro that today is National Tell a Fairy Tale t uh, Day. So do you have a, a particular fairy tale that, that you're fond of, a fairy tale that you used to read to your daughter or anything that you're particularly fond of? See, my problem is I always was fascinated the story behind the fairy tales. So, like, going back to the original, like, really dark background yes, yes. of a lot of them. Um, so with my daughter, we really just got fairy tales and nursery rhymes. She, like, wants to get the books, and I teach her, like, well, this is what, like, Hansel and Gretel really means. And <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if it's, if it's a light, happy thing, but we do read them, and then kind of it's probably the librarian in me, but go back and look at, like, where is the story coming from and what was going on in the country when they, like, wrote this? And, like, was it really political or was it, like, warning kids not to wander <laughs> off because a troll would eat them? Right. Um, <laughs> that, that, that might be the historian in you because I, I do that stuff too. I always like to research the background of where those things came <laughs> from. And speaking of kind of the morbid side of fairy tales, did you know that Cinderella's stepsisters – actually cut their toes off trying to fit into that glass yeah, that's, oh that's gross it's so dark disney like spends things to be very happy but the actual <laughs> stories are a lot darker and morbid <laughs> yeah oh, it is crazy and speaking of dark next break we have my uh, my big brother coming on and he can be a little bit dark and morbid <laughs> but he tries to keep it light here for uh, for the radio we got big t's five minutes of fame shannon are you good at trivia do you want to play with us for a few minutes I'll give it a try, yeah. <laughs> All right, fantastic. City Librarian Shannon Vonnegut, we've got trivia fun coming up, so stick around. You can play along, too, in your car or there at home. This is SCVI and I Lead School's Eye on the Valley. You're listening to your hometown station, KHTS. No words can describe the power of belonging to a group of close friends or being part of a family. Insight Treatment Center was founded more than 20 years ago to give teenagers a community of friends and family as they overcome issues like depression, anxiety, and trauma. The new Santa Clarita location is a COVID-secure environment where distance and good airflow are a priority. As a leader in providing intensive outpatient treatment to teenagers, 
Insight Treatment Center in Santa Clarita is here to help. Call 888-295-9995 or go online to insighttreatment.com. Coyote Creek location, there's lots to offer. Three acres of manicured landscape, actually in the heart of Agua Dulce in the Santa Clarita Valley. Craving the outdoors? I know I am. What about a baby shower, wedding ceremony, reception, picnic, holiday parties? Everything's been moved outside. We need to support healthy space and distancing, I know. But it's not how far apart we are, it's definitely about the treasured memories we create. Making moments with loved ones, friends, family. How do you beat that? Go to CoyoteCreekLocations.com. You've got to book your next perfect event. CoyoteCreekLocations.com. Moms, dads, this is Carden Ellis, owner of Unipest. If your house has ants, spiders, or gophers, or you want a free orange oil termite inspection, you have to call Unipest Termite and Pest Control, Santa Clarita's only factory certified orange oil pest control company. We specialize in organic, low impact, and traditional pest control options that are all kid friendly, pet friendly, and affordable with no contracts, and we're SCV owned and operated. Call us at 661 BUG 7575 or visit unipest.com. Sweet, salty, tastiest, bacon and pancakeiest, big yawns are okay, yummy syrups, yes way, butter pecan, blueberry, old-fashioned strawberry, never empty coffee pot, mom says it hits the spot, on the top of fluffiest, dad tells the scruffiest, scrambled eggy, pepper shaky, orange juicy, wide awake, your stuff, french toastiest, waffles with the mustiest, buttermilk is smooth and silky, tastes great, love on a plate. IHOP, everything you love about breakfast. Why did Mercedes-Benz of Valencia win the Dealer of Excellence Award in 2019? Because we strive to provide the most outstanding sales experience. Mercedes-Benz of Valencia COO, Chris Paz. We know you have high expectations. Our stellar team will meet and exceed your expectations. That's why we were named Mercedes Best of the Best, placing us in the top 10% of all Mercedes dealers nationwide. Find out how you can lease a new Mercedes for unbelievably low monthly payments. Details at mbzvalencia.com. Your hometown station, KHTS. Welcome back. You're listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. This is Matt Watson, and you're listening to SCVI and I Lead School's Eye on the Valley. And now, it is time for Big T's Five Minutes of Fame. Big T is a longtime resident and leader in the Santa Clarita Valley. He's a business leader and philanthropist. He is the quintessential family man and community member. And, uh, very few people know this, he is actually the front man for the middle-aged Iron Butterfly tribute band, Rusty Moth. Big T, welcome back. Good morning, I guess. <laughs> Good to have you. Hey, we're, we're looking at a... At a 25, 27-year-old story uh, out of the L.A. Times looking at potential city mottos for Santa Clarita. Did you realize our city still doesn't have a motto, Tony? I, I did. I did. And I have a couple of suggestions, if you'd like. Well, hey, as long as they're radio safe, go ahead and throw them. Sure. I've been out here a long time. So my first would be, how long is the wait for the party of four? <laughs> I get it. Because the restaurant, yeah, there we go. Right, right. Second, the, the last one is, you went to Saugus, right? <laughs> you remember me. <laughs> you remember me. <laughs> oh, oh man, I love me some Tigalot. All righty. So, so Tony, uh, Shannon Vonnegut, our city librarian, decided to stick around and uh, and play with us today. So she's on the line, and uh, uh, and then Patty is is here, and and I will play along Hello. as well. I just want to remind our, our, our contestants that uh, when we're playing trivia with Big T, your name is your buzzer. Make sure you shout out your name before you give your answer. What have you got for us today? You ready to roll? Y yeah, we are. Are you ready, Shannon? All right. I'm ready. And I know Patty's always ready. <laughs> always. All right. Hands on your buzzers. Okay. What's the only American state to begin with the letter P? Frog Patty. Mm. I got Frogger than Patty. Uh, I'm going Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is correct. Well, right. Huh. Name the world's biggest island. The world. Frogger. Australia? Frogger. Incorrect. Patty Madagascar? Incorrect. Damn. You got anything, Shannon? I'm not sure. Hmm. It is Greenland. Uh, huh. <laughs> I would have never thought about that. <laughs> what is the world's longest river? 
Patty. The, Mi- the Mississippi. Frogger. No, incorrect. Frogger. Amazon. Amazon. Oh, yeah, huh? Mm-hmm. Name the world's largest ocean. Patty. Patty? The Pacific. Pacific? Patty's on the board. Boom! <laughs> he's, he's quick on the buzzer today. Hey, I drank my coffee. There we go. <laughs> That's right. What country is Prague in? Um, fro- uh, Frogger. <laughs> Frogger. Czech Republic? Czech Republic is correct. <laughs> what, color, what color jersey is worn by the winners of each stage of the Tour de France? Frogger. Frogger. Yellow. Yellow is correct. Name the only heavyweight boxing champion to finish his career of 49 fights without ever having been Frogger. defeated. Frogger. Rocky Marciano. Rocky Marciano. Now, now, Matt, you know I like to stop for some of my fun facts, right? Yep. In honor of Shannon, I've got a couple of librarian fun facts, so <laughs> hopefully they're accurate and she doesn't scold me with them. But one of the oldest public libraries in the, in the country opened up in 1790 in Franklin, Massachusetts, where residents often circulated books donated by Benjamin Franklin. Philanthropist Andrew Carnegie donated $55 million, or the equivalent of $1.6 billion in today's dollars, wow. between 1886 and 1919, to open an astonishing 2,509 libraries worldwide. That's awesome. Wow. Yes, and the, you yep, knew that the one. The world's biggest library in terms of catalog and depth is the Library of Congress. 168 million items there for you. Back to some trivia. When was William Shakespeare born? Oh, you could give me a year. Okay. Uh, Frogger. <laughs> Frogger. 1562. Incorrect. Off by two years, Patty. Does that help you at all? <laughs> <laughs> Patty, Patty. Uh, <laughs> 1564. 1564 is correct. <laughs> I took a guess. I took the over. <laughs> who, was, who was Henry VIII's first wife? Uh, Patty. Uh, Patty. Is it a Marie Antoinette? No. <laughs> Incorrect. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I'm uh, just guessing that one. <laughs> you got Librarian Shannon laughing at you. Frogger. I'll go with Frogger. Anne Boleyn. Incorrect. You got it, Shannon? Is it Catherine of Aragon? Yes, Catherine of Aragon. Good. You Shannon's on the board. <laughs> All right, cool. There we go. What's the oldest? What's the oldest surviving printed book in the world? Ooh, Frogger. Frogger. The Gutenberg Bible. Incorrect. Dated 18, or excuse me, 868 AD. Come on, Shannon. The Diamond Sutra. Oh, okay. In publishing, what does P-O-D mean? Print on demand. Um... Why about some tough ones? Who wrote the Vampire Chronicles? Oh. Um... I don't know. I don't know that either. <laughs> oh, Anne Rice. No, no, no. Yes, Anne Rice. Okay. And now it's three, three for Shannon, three for Matt, two for Patty. Okay, okay. I, Tony, you got to give Shannon a chance to answer. Can you hear her when she's buzzing in? <laughs> I cannot. I cannot hear her at all. Okay, so you're really gonna have to shout. <laughs> okay, Ellie, all louder. <laughs> okay. I'm. I'm sorry. No, I. I can't hear at all. So, um, what flavor is Quantro? Uh. Frogger. Orange? Frogger. Orange is correct. Maddie on the more, lead. Right. What uh, what country and its territories cover the most time zones? Uh, Frogger. I'm going Russia. Frogger. Incorrect. Shannon, you got anything? That was my guess. Um, country. Canada? She says Canada. It's actually France. <clears throat> Interesting. The, oh, I see. Right. Their territories. Okay. Okay. Wow. Crazy. Yep. What's the tallest breed of dog in the world? Oh. Um. Frogger. Mastiff. No, it is not. Uh oh. Patty. Great Dane. Great Dane is correct. Ooh. Oh, nice. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Library fun fact, the New York Public Library actually offers more than just books. Members can also borrow accessories like neckties and briefcases if you're looking to uh, complete that ensemble for a job interview. Wow. Hey, Shannon, can, wow. so is, is like clothing rental coming soon to Santa Clarita Libraries? 
No, Probably not the Austin not. Town. Probably not. But a library of things <laughs> is very popular. We're looking at that. A, a library like, what? Uh-huh. A library of things. So, like, oh. you check out a cake pan or a drill or other things that you just need to borrow but don't want to own. What a great idea. Okay. That is. That's awesome. Cool. All right, back to some trivia. Yeah. What does the Olympic motto, Scythius, Altius, and Fortius, mean? Uh, Frogger. Frogger. Let's see. Uh, it's got to be something like stronger, faster, higher. And that is correct. Faster, higher. What? Faster, good. Whoa. Oh, check what? it out. Um, that's now gaining away now. All righty. How, how many ribs are in the human body? Oh. Patty. Uh, I'm probably wrong, but 28. I'm just throwing a number. You're you're close, Patty. Ooh, but I'm not correct. No, it's, it's 24. 24. Okay. How are we doing time wise? Uh, looks like we have like about another like two minutes or so. All right. Perfect. What pop group was Victoria Beckham part of? Ooh, Frogger. Spice. <laughs> I got Frogger first. It was that Shannon or Patty? That was so Shannon. that was Shannon second. I, I think it was the Spice Girls, wasn't it? Yes, it was the Spice Girls. All right. All right, Maddie. Maddie's leading. What was what was John F. Kennedy's middle name? Shannon. Oh, Shannon. Shannon. Mm-hmm. Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald is correct. That's right. I know. It was All right. Actually, I couldn't figure out what it was. Four, three, six. What's the only muscle in your body that is only attached at one end? Oh, oh, Frogger. That's Frogger. the tongue, right? <laughs> that is the tongue. Uh, now it's correct. seven. Seven for Matt. Which chess piece is the only one that can move diagonally? Um, Frogger, the bishop. The bishop is correct. Woo-hoo. Name the three primary colors. Patty. Blue, Patty. blue, yellow, and red. That is correct, Patty. Oh, bingo. Freddie write, Patty, you... Patty writes most of his essays in crayon. That's how he does that. <laughs> How'd you know? Uh, how many how many valves does a trumpet have? Ooh, Frogger four. Incorrect. Shoot, Patty, it's one less. Three. Oh, <laughs> three. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon with, Shannon with the steel, it is three. And before she catches what? up with me, I think we've got to go, don't yeah. we, Patty? Yeah, we're at one minute now. Uh, all righty, we do have to take off. Patty, what was that final score? Uh, Maddie, you, you got with seven, Patty was at four, and Shannon was at five. All righty. Shannon, thanks so much for playing along with us. I appreciate it, and thank you for everything that you do. Tony, you have a great weekend. Shannon, you do the same. When we come back, we're going to be talking space exploration and a project that's getting students actively involved in the process. Stay tuned. I'm Matt Watson, and you're listening to SCVI, and I lead school's Eye on the Valley on your hometown station, KHTS. Excellence isn't just a word, it is what we deliver. Vanguard Protection Group is committed to providing its clients with the highest echelon of protective services available. Our clients not only receive the security services they contract for, but also reports that are well-written, articulate, and thorough. Our patrol officers operate at the highest levels and have an impressive rapport with local law enforcement. With military, police, private policing, and courtroom experience, you can trust that we have the strength to deliver our promise of excellence. Contact Vanguard Protection by calling 661-753-3611 or visiting their website at vanguardprotectiongroup.com. Calm. Sweet, salty, tastiest, bacon and pancakeiest, big yawns are okay, yummy syrups, yes way, butter pecan, blueberry, old-fashioned strawberry, never empty coffee pot, mom says it hits the spot, omelets are the fluffiest, dad's hugs the scruffiest, scrambled eggy, pepper shaky, orange juicy, wide awake, stuff, french toastiest, waffles with the mustiest, buttermilk is smooth as silky, tastes great, love on a plate. IHOP, everything you love about breakfast. Why did Mercedes-Benz of Valencia win the Dealer of Excellence Award in 2019? 
because we strive to provide the most outstanding sales experience. Mercedes-Benz of Valencia COO, Chris Paz. We know you have high expectations. Our stellar team will meet and exceed your expectations. That's why we were named Mercedes Best of the Best, placing us in the top 10% of all Mercedes dealers nationwide. Find out how you can lease a new Mercedes for unbelievably low monthly payments. Details at mbzvalencia.com. KHTS AM 1220 and 98.1 FM Santa Clarita. It's 9 o'clock. Time for national news on KHTS. A safe return to work on Lisa Brady, Fox News. That's part of the focus at a White House COVID briefing just wrapping up. The Biden administration teaming up with national trade groups to promote masking, vaccinations and public health education, hoping to reach hundreds of thousands of businesses with that campaign. This is the effort to keep reaching more people with vaccines also continues. Fox's Rachel Sutherland has more live. Lisa, the Biden administration is opening two new vac- vaccination sites, one in North Carolina and another in Illinois. White House COVID senior advisor Andy Slavitt says the centers will be up and running in two weeks. United Center in Chicago will be used to vaccinate up to 6,000 people per day. And in North Carolina, a new site in Greensboro will have the capacity to vaccinate 3,000 people per day. Slava says the facilities will be set up in areas with the greatest need. President Biden is visiting a newly opened community vaccination center in Texas today. Lisa? Thanks, Rachel. The president's also visiting Texas to show support and see damage firsthand after last week's devastating storms and extreme cold. While on Capitol Hill, the House prepares to vote on his COVID relief plan over objections from Republicans who say there's too much non-COVID money in it. Conservatives are taking on cancel culture and praising liberty at the CPAC meeting in Florida where former President Trump will speak Sunday. Texas Senator Ted Cruz predicts the Republican Party will unify, telling Fox's Evan Brown this morning. I believe the Democrats are going to overshoot. They're going to go too far. Their ideas don't work. And that means 2022 is going to be a very good election and 2024 is going to be a very good election. Earlier chance of freedom breaking out when an event coordinator reminded the audience masks should be worn in the ballroom. A mixed day on Wall Street. The Dow's down 230 points, but the Nasdaq's up more than 100. America is listening to Fox News. Do not hire Franklin and Sons Electrical. The guy told me he'd shrink my monthly bill, and I'm like, dude, it's too small to read as it is. No matter how hard you work for your small business, online reviewers will find something to complain about. Then he's like, where's the circuit breaker? I'm like, bro, I didn't break anything. And while Progressive can't save you from these trolls, we can help you save money on commercial auto and business insurance. He told me I had a blown fuse. Uh, It's called a short fuse, and yes, I do have one, so watch yourself. Get a quote online today at ProgressiveCommercial.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company, affiliated and third-party insurers. So much is happening, but who can you trust? You need to check out Newsmax TV, the fastest-growing news channel in America. Watch it on all major cable systems and see shows with Sean Spicer, Greg Kelly, Lindsey Keith, Stinchfield, and Rob Schmidt. They're giving you the real story on Biden and Pelosi. So download the free Newsmax app on your smartphone now or watch Newsmax on Roku, YouTube, Pluto, Zumo, and more. 30 million Americans watch Newsmax TV. So should you. Iraq is denying any direct involvement in last night's U.S. airstrike in Syria, targeting Iranian-backed fighters. Iraqi military says it did not cooperate with the U.S. military in striking Iran's proxy forces in eastern Syria. Iraq's military says it shares information only when it comes to the war with ISIS. Last night, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin thanked Iraq for its help in the U.S. airstrike. On Friday in the Gulf of Oman, an explosion blew up part of an Israeli-owned cargo ship. In a sign, Iran might be taking revenge after the U.S. airstrikes. In recent years, Israel has carried out over 200 airstrikes against Iranian militias in Syria, similar to the one launched by American forces Friday morning. At the Pentagon, Lucas Tomlinson. Fox News. A pre-dawn fire in a commercial part of Compton, California, has spread to rows of charter-style buses parked next door, sending up a huge column of smoke visible across Los Angeles. The cause is under investigation. Fire officials, though, say it does not appear to be suspicious. Social media platform TikTok settles a multi-million dollar class action lawsuit 
over privacy concerns. Documents filed in federal court in Illinois show that ByteDance, the Chinese company that owns TikTok, has agreed to pay $92 million to settle a class action lawsuit over privacy claims from some U.S. users of TikTok, the short video app that accused a TikTok of infiltrating its users' devices and extracting a broad array of private data. The Federal Trade Commission and U.S. Justice Department also looking into allegations over privacy concerns involving TikTok. Jeff Manasso, Fox News. Tiger Woods has been moved to a different Los Angeles hospital after the car crash and surgery earlier this week on his badly broken right leg. They say he's been moved for continuing orthopedic care and recovery. And Lisa Brady, this is Fox News. I'm Stuart Varley, and this is the Fox Business Report. The Dow Jones Industrials have been losing ground. Technology shares in the NASDAQ are making some recovery after this week's tech sell-off. Consumer incomes rose 10% last month, pushed up by stimulus payments and enhanced unemployment. And people are back to buying things. Consumer spending rose 2.4%. Consumer sentiment improved this month, a sign of confidence in the economy, though the reading is still below January levels. Another economic reading, the Chicago Business Barometer, softened this month. Discount footwear retailer Payless is now out of bankruptcy reorganization and is planning to open its first store in Miami next week. It closed its 2,500 North American stores as part of its reorganization. That's your Fox Business Report. I'm Ginny Cosola. Invested in you. Finding great candidates to hire can be like, well, trying to find a needle in a haystack, but not with ZipRecruiter. Its powerful technology actively finds and invites qualified candidates to apply to your job. So while other companies might deliver a lot of hay, ZipRecruiter finds you the needle in the haystack. See why four out of five employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash free. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash free. Thanks for listening to KHTS AM 1220, Canyon Country, California, K260CO 98.1 FM, Santa Clarita, California. Time for a car wash, but fearful of the scratches that go along with it? Canyon Car Wash and Valencia Car Wash proudly use 100% lamb's cloth to prevent scratches and provide the best wash possible. Both locations use environmentally friendly solutions to wash and wax your vehicle, and they both accept all other car wash coupons. Give your vehicle the wash it deserves. Visit Candy Car Wash on Soledad across from Edwards Cinema or Valencia Car Wash on Creekside Road behind Target. Moms, dads, this is Cardin Ellis, owner of Unipest. If your house has ants, spiders, or gophers, or you want a free orange oil termite inspection, you have to call Unipest Termite and Pest Control, Santa Clarita's only factory certified orange oil pest control company. We specialize in organic, low impact, and traditional pest control options that are all kid friendly, pet friendly, and affordable with no contracts, and we're SCV owned and operated. Call us at 661 BUG 7575 or visit unipest.com. The following is sponsored programming and does not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of KHTS or its ownership. Welcome back. You are listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. This is Matt Watson. I am your host, and you are listening to SCVI and I Lead Schools Eye on the Valley. My next two guests are working on a project that is getting students involved in space exploration, not as observers, but as actual participants. Shauna Brown is a fourth and fifth grade facilitator at SCVI Charter School on the west side of the valley, just off of Newhall Ranch Road. Shauna is a graduate of Adolfo Camilo High School and has a degree in chemistry from Cal State Channel Islands. She recently guided her learners through a project where they proposed a new land for Disneyland. You know, like Disneyland has Fantasyland, Tomorrowland, Frontierland. Well, her learners created their own plans for a new land and then presented that to actual Disney Imagineers. And Kathleen Fredette is the director of STEAM initiatives with iLead Schools. Kathleen has spent most of her career on the forefront of the fields of science and engineering and education. 
She is an Airborne Astronomy Ambassador for NASA SOFIA, a NASA Endeavor Leadership Correct. Distinction Award recipient, a Woman in Aerospace National Award recipient, a Space Foundation Teacher Liaison, an Educational Advisor to the Board at the Southern California Soaring Academy, and a member of both the National Science Teacher Association Advisory Board and the Aerospace and Dream Up Advisory Board. Shauna, Kathleen, welcome back to Eye in the Valley. Thanks for having us. Hi. It's good to have you both. Thanks for, for joining us today. Kathleen, why don't we start with you? Um, we're, we're talking today about space exploration and what you guys are doing to get our kids, even as young as, as fourth graders, involved, actively involved in current space exploration. So Kathleen, why don't you give us a little bit of a, a history of the project? Because you've been leading this project and, and others similar to it uh, for a while now, right? Where did the idea come from and, and kind of how did it evolve to where we are today? Well, thanks for asking that, Matt. Um, so our goal is to broaden the horizon for young people to understand um, the impact they can have right now on space exploration and why we're doing that. So this particular project is called Dream Up to Space. And in this project, what are kids going to walk away from? Um, they're going to figure out why do astronauts float, right? And that's a question you can ask most adults. Hey, why do you think an astronaut floats? Hey, Matt, let's play that game. <laughs> what do you think? Let me just pause in the middle of talking, which is so rude. In the, uh, <laughs> it, it, what do you think most people would say, Matt, if, if, if we went to a group of adults and said, why do you think an astronaut floats? What do you think most people would say? Well, I can tell you what my answer would have been a couple of years ago before I started working with you in this project. And that was, it, it's quite simple. There's no gravity. And so you just kind of, lift away and, and just float around in there. There's nothing to kind of hold you down anywhere would have been my answer. So that is so right on. And that's most everyone in the population's answer, including kids. But it's and not so true, we address it? that. Yeah. It is not true. It's absolutely not true. So we want our kids to walk away with what really is happening. What does that do? That helps them to understand some basic knowledge and science around forces. And then we also want them to get an idea of the asset that we use, which is the International Space Station, where that is in the universe, where that is in comparison to where we are, the moon, the whole solar system. And then why is it there? What is that collaborative nature of it being an international lab? Well, and Kathleen, then before we, you move on, though, yeah. uh, we, we, we can't yeah, yeah. just leave people in, in suspension there knowing that they have the wrong answer for <laughs> floating in space. Um, so I want to make sure, check me on this one here, why we float in space. We're actually not floating. We're experiencing a phenomenon called microgravity where we're actually in perpetual freefall. We're not floating. We're actually falling and just never landing, right? That's a good way to say it. You know, that's a good way to say it. You can think about the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a easy, I can just say yes, or I can talk to more about that. <laughs> Which one? Yes well, is the answer. Yes with a but, but it sounds an, like. <laughs> well, I would just say this. It's um, an easy thought experiment because you can say this. Why does the moon, you know, why does the moon do what? Orbit around the earth. Mm-hmm. Why does it? Well, it's kind of like a, it's kind of tied to the earth closely enough to where it stays close, but not close enough to where it smashes into the earth because it's being pulled on by multiple objects at the same time. Well, that's a biggie. Great answer. Shauna, what would you say? Why does the earth orbit? Wow, we've, we've digressed. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Well, I'm just actually really excited for guests to hear the conversation that we're having because <laughs> this is the kind of mental struggle that we're like providing for our learners too because they were taught, you know, or they have these misconceptions of, you know, oh, well, it must be this. But then we have these really rich conversations about, well, why? And this is me um, deflecting and wanting to hear more from you, Kathleen. <laughs> well, I just, I, I love what you just said, Shauna, because let's go back to the original question. Why do we do these things and what are we doing? Yeah. We're doing authentic projects that are related to space that help the kids develop skills and knowledge that a scientist or an engineer or an explorer 
would need to develop to be able to be in the arena. So we provide these opportunities um, and we break down misconceptions and build new conceptions and new content. So um, thanks for saying that. And I, and I love the richness of these these experiences for learners and grown-ups as well, right? Because as facilitators, we're learning a lot. So in the end, I'm just going to say the moon is in the gravitational pull of the earth. If it wasn't, it would careen off into wherever. So it's in the gravitational pull of the earth because of its magnitude. So then you just ask yourself in this thought experiment, well, where's the International Space Station compared to the distance between the Earth and the moon. So, Matt, where do you think the, the, the space station is compared to the Earth and the moon, if well, you drew a line between the Earth and the moon? Uh, well, it would be way closer to the Earth. It's uh, kind of in what us historians would call the Earth's sphere of influence, much more so than the moon. <laughs> Correct, right? It's only about, what, 200 miles up? Oh, really? Which is, if yeah. you think about it, like, you know, from my house to Las Vegas is right. about that much or even less, right? Yeah. So if you think about driving that, so that, that thought experiment helps folks really understand, oh, well, wait, if the moon is in the gravitational pull, then for sure ISS is. So for sure, you can't say there's no gravity. And so that leads you to the new concept of what is really happening. But you've got to break down the misconception. And to Shauna's point, that's what we try to do through these really rich projects. Well, and through these projects, you bring up the International Space Station. What you guys are doing, it, it, we've been talking about this, Kathleen, for probably six, seven years now. But it, it still blows my mind every time we talk about it. Uh, our kids, you guys are leading them through a process where they, one, they propose experiments from, you know, whatever they can think of, as long as it fits within the constraints of the uh, the, the, the flight specs. We'll go over that in just a second. Um, but kids are coming up with these different experiments that will help further uh, research in the area of space exploration as we look forward to colonizing the moon and Mars. They don't just propose these experiments. They conduct them here in the classroom. And then a few lucky kids will actually have their experiments conducted for them by astronauts on the International Space Station. It is, it is super exciting. Shauna, I know this isn't your first pass through this project either. Can you tell us how, how it's designed to run, how it kind of rolls out? I know things have changed a lot over the last year. So let's just start kind of with the basic foundation of how it mm -hmm. it's designed to run when your classroom is like your classroom mm -hmm. and your kids are there with you and, you know, under normal circumstances. How does this project yeah. typically roll out? Absolutely. And one of the things I'm really proud of is that the structure of the project was actually able to um, conserve its integrity. And the way that we rolled it out virtually was really Scarily similar to how we were able to roll it out in the classroom. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. But in yeah, um, normal circumstances, we would be in the classroom and we would roll out this really exciting unit of everything that we were just talking about and introducing learners to common misconceptions about space and, um, you know, leading them through the content through exploration and discussion and observation. Um, and that kind of prepares them really well to start thinking about, well, you know, you've learned all about the ISS. You've learned about what's going on up there. What would you send? And, oh, hey, this is an actual opportunity, so really be thoughtful about it, you know. And then the learners get to research what experiment they would send up there and why it's relevant to space exploration right now. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not that they're sending up cotton candy and something else just for fun. I mean, the experiments that we're sending up is providing data for future studies. Right. When astronauts are asked to go live more permanently, you know, off of Earth, which I think is just incredible. So anyways, they come up with these experiments and they submit a proposal and there's a very rigorous um, selection process and we'll narrow it down to one or two, um, depending on the year. This year, we're, um, we're sending up two. Oh, wow. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just really incredible. And then once the proposal is selected, you know, that means that this opportunity has opened up to one learner who had an idea, mm-hmm. which is cool. But the greatest part about education is opening up those doors and exposing as many people to this opportunity as possible. So we um, open up an application for people to join this learner's launch team. Okay. And so they are heavily involved as a leader in selecting who they want to be their teammates in this journey. Um, and the selection process for that is really interesting, too. So I'm sure we can get more into that later. But eventually we have this launch team, and now they are this kind of all-star, you know, very high-level team that is able to fundraise for this project and um, go through outreach programs for this project and do experiment optimization, which we'll talk about more later. There's it's a really, really big responsibility, um, and the learners who end up being on the launch team are just, um, they're really fantastic to work with. So that might have been more detailed <laughs> than what you were asking for, but that's the gist of the project. And then eventually it... Um, We'll have a launch date from Kennedy Space Center, wow. and the experiment will get launched to ISS, um, and will remain up there from anywhere from like 25 to 60 days, and then return back down to Earth. All the while, we're running our own Earth experiment so that we can see the differences between microgravity and our regular sense of gravity down here. Um, And then we move into a phase of the project that we call post-flight analysis, which is where the learners really get to dive into the results of what was going on in the experiment. Right. So after everything's quote-unquote done is when it gets really exciting and they start looking at the difference between how things react here on Earth versus how things react in, in microgravity. Uh, there's there's yeah. so much to unpack there, and that's kind of the idea, right? You throw this yeah. huge project at the kids and, oh. and, and, mm-hmm. and, and lay this major question on them that leads them not to an answer but to more questions, right? And so you, yeah. you, you talk about, okay, look, guys, eventually we're going to – we're going to be doing something with Mars and the moon, whether we're going to be living there or otherwise exploring. So what kind of things uh, do we know are true and real about here on Earth? And how does that translate when we get into space? And, and what are the things that we're going to have to figure out? And then kids start proposing their projects. It, you, you narrow it down to, to one or two kids, but then you quickly open it back up by having other kids who maybe their experiment wasn't chosen for various and sundry reasons, and there's all different kinds of reasons that come up. They can then join the launch team because there's so many things to do once the, the project moves on to the next phase, and, and it culminates, well, sort of, kind of maybe climaxes, um, as you said, when those projects that the kids have designed again, I can't hit this hard enough, Kids have designed these projects, these experiments. They get launched to the ISS, the International Space Station, conducted by astronauts. It's so exciting. Yeah. So you've got two that are flying soon. Um, can you tell us just really quickly about the two projects that are that are going to be flying? What's the, the experiment? What are the kids trying to figure out? Absolutely. So this round of experiments that we're um, sending up are all about germination. And germination is that first step in the growth cycle of a plant. It's when you go from seed to sprout. Um, So it's a a very simple and basic question, you know, how does microgravity affect germination of, and then we have two different species that we're sending up. And one is an azuki bean, and then the other is a carrot seed. So we like to call our team Team Itsuki and Team Carrot, <laughs> and um, they're doing a fantastic job. Well, here, here's a really interesting little factoid, if I can just drop into this conversation and say this, that Please. just this morning, um, you know, our, our learners are in what Shauna said is experiment optimization. This is where they're doing the experiments over and over again, like she said, to hopefully um, send something up that will bring some an interesting piece of data that can be added to the pile of data that scientists are collecting. Mm-hmm. Well, one team that had cho- chosen um, the bean Vigna 
at Zuki realized that there, the container that it's is is that it's actually a little bit too big of a bean, and yeah. so um, the the little tube called a mix stick that the that is the constraint of the of the experiment for the kids. Um, they've been testing it in a fake one, and so that team is morphing to. It's going to be now called Team Radiata because they're they're staying with the same. Um, species, but it's a slightly smaller bean and it has a better germination rate. What I love about this, Matt and yeah. Shauna, is that we really are not just coming up with an idea and hoping against hope that it works, that we're really doing this thing called experiment optimization, which mm -hmm. all microgravity experimenters and scientists do in general when they're doing a science, uh, some sort of real science. So it's super exciting that our kids are dialed into this. Very fun. Yeah. And what a cool name, too. <laughs> right? Radiata. Yeah, very cool. So, Kathleen, you bring up a really good point because, uh, like you said, if our listeners can imagine, you know, when you go on a, an airplane flight and you're, you've got your carry-on, you've got these very strict limitations as to how big your luggage can be. Well, it just gets so ridiculously strict when we're talking about putting something on SpaceX, sending it up to the International Space Station. Your kids have something about as big as a pen flashlight, and that's where uh, uh, their experiment takes place. And so oftentimes our, our, our kids will propose these amazing experiments, and, and they're great ideas and things that we need to figure out. But like you said, maybe your bean's too big. And, and so you've either got to fix it, or if you can't get it fixed, then, then somebody else is going to end up flying. Or some, some amazing exper uh, experiments I remember in the past about uh, kids trying to um, like kill bacteria and things like that, and, and let's use this solution. And the only problem with that experiment was you're not going to be able to measure when the bacteria was killed. Was it in space, or was it when it was on its way back to our school? So there's all these different things that come into play, and, and the kids really have to do a tremendous amount of, like you said, tooling, retooling, reworking, uh, going through the design process over and over again. And, and that's what you're talking about when you talk about this authentic project. And so such a cool project, but, but Sean and I talked about it before, Kathleen. Um, we had this serious shift about a year ago, right? So everything kind of shut down. And everyone was faced with the, the, the idea or the question, what do you do? Do you just shut it down and wait for the world to open back up? But then as things dragged on, you know, what do you do? So Kathleen, can you tell us um, uh, what you guys did? What changes had to be made during the shutdown so that you guys could continue to execute this exciting project with your kids? Well, thanks for that question. It turned out that... Um, Myself, myself, me, me, and me and another team member, Amber <laughs> Soto, who is on our team, Matt, um, we ran the virtual project. And, and part of the reason we shifted it to, to me running it was because the facilitators in our organization, you know, the shutdown had just happened. They were really overwhelmed. And so we just said, okay, we'll run it. And here's what we developed. We developed... Um, uh, so we, we put out a call to any kid, grades 4 to 12, in any of our programs, homeschool, online, site-based, and we did a, an information night. And then we got such a big response, we had to do two of them because the Zoom call wouldn't hold it. And from there, we had the kids enter into the project as, quote, crew members. We had weekly crew briefings from Mission Control, and that was Amber and I were the Mission Control. <laughs> and we gave them units that they worked on that they were able to receive a badge on our website. And they could decide which badge level, one, two, or three. And we had some cool things that they could earn as a result of badging. And the whole badging idea was just to help them move through the difficult project. And we created these things that, that I would fondly call a guidance document, which the kids use and so, kind of like a list. They have links to things they must do. So, for example, when we talked about ISS, we created a really cool, in fact, Shauna created a really cool interactive web quest that they had to do so they could learn about the lab. So we had some things on that list that they had to do. We call those must-dos. Uh, 
And they they got maybe four points for each thing they did. Then we had a bunch of li- a list of a bunch of options of things they could do, and a lot of them were hands on model ISS or go watch this astronaut doing something, take this tour of ISS. So they had to get at least twenty points, but it was build your own adventure, and this really was a successful way to run a project, and we did that over and over again with each of our units and then also guided them through actually the proposal writing as a result of it. And we found this to be a very effective, engaging way to move kids through a difficult project. The last thing I'll say is we did a lot of celebrations. (laughs) So for example, we gave them, you know, when you were looking, they had to build a, a solar system scroll. And so then it was take a video of it. Uh, create a model, take a picture of it, and share it with us. And so we did a lot of celebrations with those crew members at those crew briefings. We would show their videos, which were really fun. Here's me doing a microgravity um, activity in slow-mo, and we all get to watch it. (laughs) And we just really highlighted the cool stuff that the kids were doing. And we also included them in coming up with other options. Like one of the options for build your own adventure was come up with your own idea. And we had so many kids who said, Miss Fredette, here's my idea. And then we gave it to everyone to try if they wanted to. So it was wildly fun for all of us. It was uh, really challenging, but I learned a lot about distance learning. Well, it, it's such an exciting project. And, and I think our listeners can start to get a sense of, A, how rigorous it is. Because like you said, kids are not only working on problem solving and, and the design process and, and reworking things so that they're successful, but they're also uh, developing uh, proposals and schematics and, and, and all these different things. And then you bring in the creativity as they ask uh, different questions and try to figure out what, the, what it is that they want to figure out. We're talking this morning with fourth and fifth grade facilitator Shauna Brown from SCVI, along with Kathleen Fredette, Director of STEAM Initiatives with iLead Schools. When we get back, we'll talk about some of the specific projects projects that are running this cycle in a little bit more depth than some of the ones that we've done in the past as well. You're listening to SCVI and I Lead Schools Eye on the Valley. I'm Matt Watson on your hometown station, KHTS. At SCVI, we don't just prepare your child for the real world. We empower them to imagine and build the world they want for themselves. Our tuition-free TK-12 charter school combines project-based learning with extracurriculars from robotics to theater to sports to give your child boundless opportunities to explore who they are. Located just off the 5 Freeway in West Santa Clarita Valley, SCVI has the only international baccalaureate program in the area. For enrollment information, including open enrollment options, visit iLeadSantaClarita.org. Santa Clarita Valley residents now have greater access to the excellent physicians and high-quality medical services for which Providence Holy Cross is known. Providence Holy Cross Health Center in Santa Clarita features state-of-the-art cancer and imaging technologies, as well as board-certified physicians in a variety of medical specialties. Quality and compassion from a health care provider you can depend on. For more information, call 1-888-HEALING or visit us at Providence.org. Bring your life. We'll help you make the most of it. Introducing Five Point Valencia, a familiar place, and yet wonderfully different, with a fresh mix of homes, schools, parks, trails, and open space. All tuned to the way people want to live today. Learn more at Valencia.com. Welcome to Duncan, where safety is their number one priority. The staff at Duncan has daily temperature checks and goes through a series of current health questions prior to each shift. They have all the necessary PPE, including masks, shields, and gloves. In addition, every store is sanitized several times an hour for your protection. Use the Duncan app for specials and to order ahead. Carry out and curbside pickup is available or have your order delivered by Grubhub, Postmates, Uber Eats, or DoorDash. Duncan, all day sandwiches, donuts, bagels, muffins, and of course, hot and cold beverages. Visit Duncan on Bouquet next to Lowe's or the Duncan and Canyon Country on Sierra Highway. The Santa Clarita Valley runs on Duncan. Your hometown station. KHTS is the only station I listen to. 98.1 FM and AM 1220.
Welcome back. You're listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. This is SCVI and I lead school's Eye on the Valley, and I am your host, Matt Watson. We're talking this morning with Shauna Brown from SCVI. Shauna teaches fourth and fifth grade, and she's joined by Kathleen Fredette, I lead school's director of STEAM initiatives. Before the break, Kathleen was talking about the process, well, we're talking about Dream Up to Space, which is a project that our, our kids are able to get their hands on and actually start to become part of the space exploration process. And Shauna, during the break, we were talking about um, what that looked like a little bit during the, the pandemic shutdown. And a big component of what our schools does is social emotional learning. And you were talking uh, again during the break about how important this project was uh, as kids were celebrating their progress during this shutdown. Can you share a little bit about what you were sharing with us? Yeah, it just so happened that the opening of this project, that that badging up process that Ms. Kathleen is talking about, was right around April, which is kind of when things really were upside down for um, our community and our, you know, our entire world. Yeah. And it was a time when we could inspire kids about space and we could get them excited about badging up and this cool new project um, that's right around the corner that they could be involved in. Um, and so Kathleen and Amber just did a really great job at providing a highlight for so many of our learners at iLead when they really, really needed it most. Yeah, when our kids were, were scared, uncertain, a little bit lonely maybe, uh, at least this, this group of kids were able to shift their focus and had something to, to get excited about. That, that is great news. So we talked a little bit about it earlier, Kathleen, um, about how, how the experiments are, are assessed and chosen. Because I, I, I got to tell you, I, I, it's something as a kid I would have gotten really excited about. Um, but then it's got to be hard when, when your experiment doesn't get chosen, but there's all different types of criteria and things like that. So Kathleen, who decides when you've got, you know, 20, 30 different experiments that come to you, and I know you've had lots of them over the years, who decides and, and how do you decide whose work ultimately gets to hitch that ride on SpaceX and go up to the space station? You know, now that's a really good question, and, and we've shifted over the five, six years that we've done this mm -hmm. from it being just a really good idea to being a really good idea that you can communicate to. <laughs> and what I mean by that is at, when we had, like, something over 120 proposals from kids a few years back, what we shifted to was not only is it a good proposal, but what is your work ethic? And so we had facilitators, you know, reviewing that idea. You know, what was the buy-in for that team? What, what, how did they work and collaborate together? And then can, they, can the kids communicate that? And so we required what we, the, the teachers at that point, or facilitators, they selected their top kids or teams. And then we went back to those teams and said, hey, you did a great job. If you want to go on to the finalists, there's more work. And the work looks like, how would you pitch this in a video? And so we asked them to make a short, basically commercial, giving the basics of why this is a really awesome idea and why they should get time on an asset like ISS. And then also they had to come up with their plan to develop what we call a launch team. Mm -hmm. So we realized a few years back, a good friend of ours, Dr. Cohen at NASA Ames, looked at me after our second year of running this and said, you've got to find a way to make this project not just reside with two or three kids who are selected. Mm -hmm. And so we moved into this idea of launch team, and Shauna referred to that. How do you make this a community event, and how do you include more kids in the process prior to sending an experiment up? This year, we used a virtual assessor's board, and that was comprised of real uh, aerospace folks, uh, some people from um, AIAA, which is a, an organization I'm connected to, some NASA folks, and we gave them a rubric. And it was not just the proposal rubric, 
but it was also the rubric for the communication skills. Mm. Were the, was this team able to communicate? And then we had the kids self-assess on their work ethic because here's the reason why. And Shauna, you know this really well. This is fun and awesome to get selected. Woohoo! We get it. We get to send something. That is only the beginning. <laughs> The next phase is getting ready to send it, and that's long and arduous and not always fun. And um, so we realized about our after our second year, part of what we were looking for for the selection team was that grit, that stamina, that enthusiasm, that excitement that will propel you through the arduous work of the science. Well, you talk about an authentic project. There's there's nothing more authentic and real world like than good work being rewarded with more work. And I love that that it just brings in all these different components, right? So that kids aren't just learning to write proposals or or learning to be uh, you know strong scientists. They're also learning to be great communicators. They're learning to be to to have grit to to persevere. It, that is, uh, gosh, it's just this kind of all in one type of project. Go ahead. If I could jump in, it really yes. has developed um, in terms of our launch team selection process. Um, Amber So had the fantastic idea of creating a virtual escape room <laughs> for all of our launch team applicants. And so everyone who wanted to join the launch team, um, they were set, put into these teams for the escape room interview, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we got to see firsthand how they communicated with each other and how they problem solved oh, with wow. their peers. And it just was fantastic. And I think that that event um, really set us up for success right now because you can tell the learners that we have on our launch teams, they are on it. They are communicators. They are problem solvers. Mm. They're critical thinkers. So the, the process that we use to select these learners has just evolved so much. Um, and, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's one of our proud moments for sure. Yeah, and I love that. So when the kids walk away from this project, even if they're not planning on a future in science or space exploration, they're learning skills that are going to make them not successful. They're going to make them leaders in whatever the next step in their future is. Shauna, every year kids have the opportunity to propose pretty much whatever experiment that they can think of. And and now there are some there are some rigorous parameters that they have to conform to. But other than that, it's kind of uh, ju only their imagination that, that limits them. We've had learners experiment on the rate of rust in space, right? Well, if we build buildings with this, will it rust? Um, whether or not yeast will, will rise in space because we need our pizzas. And, you know, you talked about seeds germinating or uh, kids have experimented on coffee and how it will affect our teeth in space. All these different things that we, we think about. You talked about, uh, you know, the, the groups, the two groups that were selected to fly for this round, uh, experimenting on germination with carrots and, and with beans. But what are some of the other ideas that kids came up with this year that, that for one reason or another aren't able to fly this year? Yeah, and I actually am going to bounce this one to Kathleen because okay. she was really okay. involved with the, pro the proposal selection process, and I'm sure she has some really good ones up her sleeve. Say that again, Matt, so, in another way. So what were, what were some of the other ideas, maybe ideas that weren't selected, but some of the other ideas that our kids are uh -oh. coming up with for, for projects? Because we had, uh, you know, we've got carrots germinating, we've got beans germinating, but what were some of the other uh, uh, experiments that kids proposed, whether it's this year or in previous years, that weren't necessarily able to fly? Yeah, we've had everything from what I would call like a higher level idea, like um, will this particular product um, eradicate a, a bacteria? Mm -hmm. Because there are problems with loads of problems with bacteria on ISS. And in a small capsule, you can imagine being a human person in an enclosed cell, really, which is what ISS is, or a spacecraft going to a long distance for a long time. You just think about that for a minute. Right. You think so this quarantine was rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Um, 
And uh, we've had things, different plants, different animals. Um, I would say that things connected to biology are a lot easier for kids to wrap their head around. And one of the things that we do is really delve into what is the impact of long-term space travel on the human body. Mm -hmm. And what will we need once we get to Moon or Mars that you can't just rock it up? So we have to think about all those products that we need and if it's something and so primarily you think about things first like food right because we need sustenance and we can't just rocket up hamburgers you know we just we just can't do that so we got to make it there <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and and it's it's tough to grow a cow on mars i i, I would imagine so yeah now so this process goes all the way through and like i said kind of it doesn't culminate because there's a lot of work even after these experiments fly um but but Shauna, kind of the the super exciting part about this is when the kids have a project that's selected, and then it ends up getting packed up, and they get put in their mix sticks, and uh, and I know you guys use a special even a special courier system because you can't just put this on a UPS truck and, and send it out to Florida. <laughs> Um, but then Shauna, it, it ends with uh, or not end it it, it kind of peaks with kids experiments being launched uh, I know you've done this before did you have the opportunity to go out with your learners and 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 watch the experiments be launched on SpaceX yes we did um, oh, so it actually happened to be right at the beginning of March of 2020 um, and it, it was it truly was for me and everyone who went it was kind of the last normal big exciting thing that we did before mm -hmm. everything shut down and I just remember as soon as we came back every of the door shut for everything um so we were we felt really lucky that we were able to sneak in that last you know once in a lifetime opportunity before our world kind of had to take a pause for a whole year now you know we're actually coming up on a year wow um pretty soon here well hopefully you can get back yeah that and we're just we're just hoping that we there's a, a term in in uh, space launch rocket launch is called slipping and so uh, you know that when a yes. when a date is pushed back and so we started out with a launch date targeted for space 22 on May 2nd and now it's June 3rd we're like keep slipping keep slipping because our kids really do and our families really do want to have the opportunity now they could go on their own right now because Kennedy Space Center is open they could go and just watch the launch by themselves but the beauty and the amazing community experience of going with we, what did we take Shauna it was like some 50 people last oh, wow. year yeah and it was family members it was siblings it was I think we had do we have grandparents I mean we had oh, yeah. the kids and then there they were in their I lead team uh, but, you know, collared shirts presenting at Kennedy Space Center and and what an enormously impactful experience that is. And it's it's like winning the Super Bowl. Your team gets to do something that in the history of ever in the history of ever hardly anyone has ever gotten to do this. And you're a kid and you get to do it. And I'm just going to add that right now as we get. Uh, as we're getting ready for this, we have two of our team members, two young girls who are who are writing blogs and introducing each of the team members um, on our website, on the I Lead Student Aerospace website. It's called Meet the Team blog. And, and reading those and hearing the impact that this project is having on, you know, one gal said, prior to this project, I never liked science. And now I love it. Oh. Okay, that makes me weep. Right? <laughs> that just makes me cry. <laughs> and then there's a little gal on, on your team, Shauna, that said, because of this project, I want to be an astronaut. Oh. I know it's going to be really hard work, but this is my goal. And, you know, yesterday in our team meeting, we, we had to take a team picture on Zoom. And so everyone, go get a prop. And that little girl put her astronaut helmet on during oh. the, for her prop. You know, it's just... Those are like the moments where you just think, yeah, this is amazing. And maybe they won't end up there, but this will be a life-altering experience. 
It will shape how they see themselves as a learner. It shapes their family. Um, the family involvement, wow, this, this oh my time goodness. is just amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I love it as well. And you're, you're absolutely right, Kathleen. If they choose not to go into the field of space exploration or, or science even, uh, it, it opens up a world of possibilities and teaches them early on that – uh, that there's really no obstacle in their way that they can't overcome. And and I love that you're rolling this out, not just with high schoolers, although our high schoolers are very involved, but you roll it out with middle school and even as early as, like I said, uh, fourth graders uh, getting to, to fly their experiments on the International Space Station. So cool. I love that it gets kids involved in space exploration rather than them watching scientists, quote unquote, real scientists doing it. Uh, it's true learning, true doing. Kathleen, Shauna, great work. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Thank you Thanks, Sean. Thank you, guys. We'll talk to you real soon. If you're interested in this type of deep and rigorous, relevant education for your kids, kindergarten <laughs> through 12th grade, you can contact SCVI or any of our other iLead schools at uh, ileadschools.org or ileadsantaclarita.org or you can give SCVI a call at 705-4820 661-705-4820 We'll be right back. This is SCVI and Ileed Schools Eye on the Valley. I'm your host Matt Watson on your hometown station KHTS KHTS strives to give the Santa Clarita Valley all the information they need. And when our computers aren't working the way they should, we call Resurgence, your true source for IT. Resurgence provides outstanding customer service while also providing the highest technical ability. They strive to do what's best to improve and protect your business. For more information on Resurgence, call 349-4114 or visit resurgenceit.com. Why did Mercedes-Benz of Valencia win the Dealer of Excellence Award in 2019? Because we strive to provide the most outstanding sales experience. Mercedes-Benz of Valencia COO Chris Paz. We know you have high expectations. Our stellar team will meet and exceed your expectations. That's why we were named Mercedes Best of the Best, placing us in the top 10% of all Mercedes dealers nationwide. Find out how you can lease a new Mercedes for unbelievably low monthly payments. Details at mbzvalencia.com. Consumers Furniture is back open for your business. The safety of our community and our staff, above all, is most important to us. We will provide a safe and clean environment for you to find the perfect piece of furniture for your home. To help you with your purchase, we are offering 25% off your entire order or 24 months same as cash financing. And for our awesome essential workers, we will deliver locally your furniture free of charge. Consumers Furniture is located in the Centerpoint Shopping Center, below Sam's Club and Walmart. Your hometown station, KHTS. Welcome back. You are listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM. And 12:20 a.m. This is SCVI and I lead schools. I on the valley. I am your host, Matt Watson. And whew, we had a great show today. I'm really excited about the show. Covered a lot of ground. Um, we we started out by uh, by covering a story that, well, to be honest, it wasn't really a story since uh, Sir Mixalot was topping the charts and Criss Cross made us all jump, jump. But we talked about suggestions for city mottos. Uh, Something that I, I stumbled across on social media this week that I thought was fun, and we had a lot of fun with suggestions for city mottos. A lot of them really nice, a lot of them really tongue in cheek, and so maybe we can put that in the suggestion box. It's Santa Clarita, a city not afraid to poke fun at itself. We uh, we also spoke with Shannon Vonnegut. She is our city librarian. She shared a lot of the different resources that our city libraries are still providing, even though. The doors aren't fully open yet. They are actually open on a, on a limited fashion as you can go in and use their computers there. You can email them some documents and go pick up the printing needs that you might have. They've got all different kinds of resources on SantaClaritaLibrary.com. So go ahead and check it out, SantaClaritaLibrary.com. Uh, she also really pushed Patty and I there on trivia with, with Big T. That was a lot of fun. Big T is always a lot of fun. And then we spent the last two breaks talking about the Dream Up project that's being conducted at SCVI and a couple of other iLead schools where kids are are participating in space exploration. And um, 
you know, another, a little bit more topical, but story that I stumbled across this week. Speaking of space, Patty, do you believe in aliens? Of course. <laughs> All righty. Well, there's, there's at least one more believer out there with you. Did you see the story uh, of that pilot that spotted a, a, a UFO the other day? No, I didn't, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there was an American Airlines pilot on a, a, a flight from Cincinnati to Phoenix who m- kind of mid-flight uh, reported an unidentified object flying over his plane in New Mexico. This was uh, just last huh. Sunday. Now, not sure why it always seems to be New Mexico. But anyways, uh, he's he's flying over New Mexico, and the pilot calls to the tower and says, do you have any other targets up here? We just we just had something go right over the top of us. I, and he says, I hate to say this, looked like a long cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile type of thing moving really fast. It went right over the top of us. Now, FAA air traffic controllers didn't see any object on their radar scopes, and the White Sands Missile Range, located in southern New Mexico, said the range wasn't conducting any tests uh, on Sunday, and and they never test in that area anyways because of the flight traffic, Um, so it couldn't have been that. Uh, Holloman Air Force Base, which is also located in the southern area of New Mexico, said that they had nothing up there. Hmm. Um, Obviously, then the next group that you contact is the FBI. The FBI in in New Mexico, true to FBI form, they they made a comment without really saying anything at all. So... um, so what do you think, Patty? Uh, you think this guy's making it up because there, there's no other confirmation of it? Um, but, you know, no reason for a pilot to just say, hey, what was that? And start all this, this controversy. <laughs> I don't like, know. It could be out there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I, 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 I always wonder why... Why New Mexico? Why don't we ever get a UFO sighting? Because it's all deserty, I guess. Right. But no one's out there. You would think, you know, why don't we ever get a UFO sighting over Valverde or... <laughs> Beverly Hills. Right. <laughs> a- aliens abducting someone from Stevenson Ranch or <laughs> mysterious orbs circling over Town Center Drive. I, you know what I think it might be? We've got no motto. Yeah. Why would the aliens bother stopping at a city with no motto? <laughs> so let's keep pushing Awesome Town. Let's get this done. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank my guests, City Librarian Shannon Vonnegut, my brother Big T, Kathleen Fredette, I Lead Schools Director of STEAM Initiatives, and fourth and fifth grade facilitator Shauna Brown. I want to thank you for joining us and join us again next week and every Friday, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. I am Matt Watson, and this is SCVI and I Lead Schools Eye on the Valley on your hometown station, KHTS. Have a great weekend, everybody.